Well, hello and welcome to Rare Classic Cars on the cold weekend here. So because the salt has gone back on the road, we're going to talk about more on the best of worst of series. And let's talk about a classic engine that could be under the hood of a number of Fords from 1954 to 1964. And also Mercury's too. And that is the Y-Block engine. Yes, the Ford Y-Block. So the Y-Block was introduced, as I said, in 1954 to replace the venerable, if not overly powerful, flathead. And it came to market a year before the Chevrolet small block did, which happened in 1955. And, you know, it's, it's probably tough on the Y-Block in a number of key areas. One is that it replaced an engine that was quite beloved for its smoothness. And like I said, even though it had a lack of power, the Ford Flathead V8 that the Y block replaced only had about 110 horsepower. It was known as being very reliable. The hot rod community really understood it. And the Y block also was designed to use detergent oils at a time when there were both detergent and non detergent oils. And many people honestly opted for the cheaper non detergent oils and ended up clogging some of the oil passages, uh, particularly the center cam bearing that was then used to feed the upper portions of the engine. And so if you didn't use the right oil, you didn't change it with the right frequency, you drove in a lot of stop and go conditions in the winter time where the oil didn't have a chance, the engine didn't have a chance to warm up. There was this tendency to have challenges with the upper end of the engine not getting the right amount of oiling. And that created a lot of challenges. So maybe just a little bit more history and a little bit more uh, in-depth comments on that. As I said, the Y-Block was introduced in 1954 and it was came out in 239 cubic inch form. And the flathead, as I said, was 110 horsepower. And this Y-Block that it replaced, or that uh, replaced the flathead was 130 horsepower. So pretty big difference at the time, you know, significantly more power. Doesn't sound like a lot today, but 20 horsepower on a base of 110 horsepower is almost a 20% increase. So it was quite, quite substantial. And then that was in the Fords and in the Mercury's, it was 256 cubic inches. And I think the Mercury's were around 161 horsepower and replacing a Mercury flathead that was 125 horsepower. So big jump on the Mercury engines as well. Lincoln did have a Y block. And the Y comes from the deep skirted design. So a lot of people call the 317 cubic inch engine that was in Lincoln's in 1954 also a Y block. It was different though. It was a different engine. So we're not going to talk about that one, but this is really the Ford and Mercury version of the Y block. It was also for Ford's first overhead valve design. Remember they went from the flathead to the overhead valve. And as I said, it fed oil through the rocker arms or fed oil to the rocker arms through a passage in the center camshaft bearing. And remember, this was one of Ford's first overhead valve V8s. And so they were learning some things. This particular engine did feed the rocker arms and the upper end oiling uh, systems of the engine through passages in the cam bearing. And as I mentioned, if the oil wasn't changed frequently and non-detergent oil was used, you know, some, that, that passage tended to clog up. And then the upper, areas of the engine wouldn't get fed with the right amount of oil. In 1955, the engine was enlarged to 272 cubic inches. And remember in 1955, the Chevrolet small block V8 came out and that was 265 cubic inches. So Ford one upped Chevrolet by about seven cubic inches. Uh, <laughs> at least they could say that they had, you know, a larger uh, V8 at the time. And it was came, it was about 162 to 182 horsepower. So starting to increase the power from the 130 when it started, obviously displacement helps with that. And then it really started heating up as the fifties went on to the point that, you know, it went from 272 to 292 and then some of the Thunderbirds and in 56 it went to 312 cubic inches. And when it was 312 cubic inches, you could get it in two barrel, four barrel, two four barrel Paxton supercharger, uh, form. So it was really making some good horsepower at the time. Now, one other thing I will say is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, kits were sold at that time that were external oiling kits to help feed that upper end of the engine in the case that the holes of the cam bearings did not 
you know, allow for the right amount of passage to the upper part of the engine. So you'll see, and I'll put a picture here of the kit, one of the kits that was, uh, was used. And this was very popular during the day to circumvent this issue. However, it's not always the case. There's a lot of urban myths about these engines. And, you know, I will say they, they did have oiling problems, but there are some tricky things associated with them. First of all, it is true that if you didn't change the oil or use the non-detergent oil and that passage plugs up, you're in trouble. That is true. But they all, there are also challenges even with, I would say, more newly rebuilt engines having oiling issues, especially if those external oil feed tubes are not employed. And why is that? Well, there's a couple things. I would say most pro predominantly the rocker arm shafts, you have to get them in the right alignment so that the oil feed holes align with the holes in the uh, cylinder head. And if they're misaligned or become misaligned, you really miss out on that oiling as well. Again, if you, especially if you eliminate the external feed tubes. And then a lot of people, there's this myth that they spun cam bearings. And when you spin the bearing, you misalign the hole in the cam bearing with where the hole is supposed to push the oil through and at least from what I can understand about these engines it really wasn't so much that the bearing had actually spun it was that oftentimes they were not installed correctly from the factory they had three different holes in the cam bearing and sometimes only two of them were aligned correctly and you can imagine with one-third of the potential oil passage there blocked off that really wasn't doing uh, the engine any favors so I would say if you're going to have a rebuilder touch these, you need somebody who really knows, especially now that, I mean, who knows how to rebuild and the, knows the minutia of a Ford engine from 1954 to 1964. Not many people out there. You need to find somebody who really understands this engine and understands it quite well, especially if you want to eliminate those external oil feed tubes because the engine is highly sensitive to all these different parameters. It has other issues as well, but I would say, in my experience, that those are the ones that most predominantly choke off the oil to the upper part of the engine. And it's, it's kind of unfortunate because otherwise, I would say, for the time, you know, they were, I would say, quite good. Now, they didn't last nearly as long as the Chevrolet small block, which, as I said, started in 1955 and continued in that same form all the way through to, you know, the late 90s even for GM. This engine didn't last that long for Ford. It went from 1954 to 1964, and it was kind of superseded along the way by the FE engines or the Ford Edsel engines in the Fords, and then the MELs, the Mercury Edsel Lincoln engine in the Mercury's. So it was superseded, you know, relatively quickly. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a long-lived engine. And I would say in part because these oil issues doomed it a bit and they had a bad reputation back in the day. So Ford thankfully corrected that. I would say that the FE and MEL engines are really, really excellent engines. And the MEL engine, wow, is that thing a boat anchor. Not, not from the standpoint that it stinks, from the standpoint of it's huge, it's heavy, it is a lump of a cast iron mill uh, in a good way. It's a, it's a really good engine. Uh, we can talk about that one in another video series. But this was an engine that really, I think, gave some of the Ford buyers of the time some heartburn. And as I said, it was a tough act to replace the flathead, which, although not powerful, and by that point had been stretched to its limits, it was really a beloved engine. And if you've had one and, and driven one, you'll know why. It is one of those engines where you, you key it and you start it. And just like the six-cylinder, the 261 cubic inch six-cylinder by Prezian and the 235 Chevrolet six-cylinders, you don't hear anything running. You just see the fan spinning. And some of that's the low compression ratio for the time. Some of it's just the engine design and how it was built. But they are beautifully smooth, and they have a nice sound to them, too. These Y blocks, I don't think people necessarily cared for the sound that they made. They had the oiling problems. They had, you know, they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't obviously as beloved as others. And I think they gave Ford a bad reputation for a few years on that. Uh, in terms of their overhead valve V8s. So in any case, thought I would share that one 
number of you have commented about the Y block, and I have driven them, and I have some experience with them. And like I said, the I love the Fords of that particular era. The uh, I think you know even the '57 Ford with those little tail fins and the wraparound one-piece bumper and the hood that's hinged humorously uh, for safety reasons, so that it opens backward. I think is kind of cool, and they have the safety padded dash. A neat, neat looking car. And the 58 Fords are nice. Of course, the Skyliners and things like that. But thought I would highlight this engine that I think it kind of deserves to be on the, the worst engines list because it really hurt Ford's reputation from an overhead valve engine perspective. Thanks again for watching. Enjoy your weekend and take care. Thanks again for watching this video on Ford's worst engines of all time, talking about the Y Block V8 from 1954 to 1964. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more people like you. And also feel free to email me at rareclassiccars at yahoo.com and check out the video thumbnails at the bottom left and right for videos that YouTube has served up for you. Thanks again for watching and take care.